probably that guy that was in the hotel next to us. the National Baseball Hall of Fame induction class of 2020, Ted Simmons. Congratulations to all the other inductees. Thank you, Jane Forbes Clark, National Baseball Hall of Fame, for creating this special experience for everyone today. As a youngster in Detroit, Michigan, I was a Tiger fan. I grew up idolizing Norm Cash, Rocky Colavito, Frank Larry, and Bill Free. It was in that era that I discovered my first hero, Al Kaline. He had no idea how much he impacted my life or what a role model he became for me. In my youth, Kaline was my hero. As I stand before you as a man, he remains my hero today. There are many roads to Cooperstown. One look at this very special group behind me makes that clear. For some, it comes quickly, and for others, it takes a little time. For those like myself, the path is long, and even though my path fell on the longer side, I would not change a thing. However we get here, however we get here, none of us arrives alone. I'm no exception. Gene, Charlie Daniels, and Fred Fournier, my earliest coaches, prepared me for the sand lots of Detroit where every major league prospect Charlie in Detroit Davis, came to play. My babysitter's husband. Fred Davis and Ray Coles guided me through those four summers in the Detroit Amateur Baseball Federation. Dave Sebring, Freddie Goldberg, and Ed Bryant steered me through junior high school and high school, athletically and academically. Athletically, I got all A's. Academically, not so much. <laughs> but I did well enough that they eagerly passed me into the lab of Moby Benedict, who ushered me into the University of Michigan. Moby was the head baseball coach for the Wolverines. In June of 1967, I signed a professional baseball contract with the St. Louis Cardinals, making myself ineligible to play college baseball. Regardless, three months later, in September of that same year, I began classes in Ann Arbor. Moby Benedict made that happen for me, and I still owe him. My trip to the minors was a fast one. Joe Cunningham, my manager at the A-level, was the first major league hitter to tell me that I would become one myself. I believed him because he had been one himself. Warren Spahn, my AAA manager, was the first Hall of Fame member I was ever around on a regular basis. He was a proud and very confident man. It was George Kissel, the Cardinals' Mr. Everything, who had the greatest impact on me. He taught me fundamental baseball and how to play to win. I also learned from George how to win and lose with grace. He gave me my first taste of humility. Nobody came through the Cardinals organization to St. Louis without Kissel's blessing. Nobody. And his blessing had to be earned. If George Kissel said no, you did not go. I would like to take a moment to take and mention four other men who changed the lives of every player on this stage today by pushing the boundaries of player rights in this game. Kurt Flood, who paid the price for challenging the reserve clause. Kathy 
Chris Hunter for showing what would happen if a major league player actually became a free agent. <laughs> Andy Messersmith for charting the course to free agency by becoming the first major league player to overcome one and one. And Marvin Miller, who made so much possible for every major league player from my era to the present and the future. I could not be more proud to enter this great hall with this great man. Our game is about wins and losses, but after 50 years of organized baseball, I've learned that it's so much more. Baseball is about all the names and faces that remain firmly planted in one's memory. My major league experience as a player was long, and the rosters of those teams listed many great players. They also listed countless others, not nearly as recognizable, but their faces remain with me just as indelibly. My other baseball life has been on the administrative and player evaluation side. I've been a farm director, general manager, and a major league scout. Here I began to see the inner workings of the baseball industry and a new world was opened up to me. My role on the administrative side of baseball has been just as important to me as my active playing career. I've worked with men like Dal Maxville, John Sheerholtz, John Hart, Kevin Towers, and Jack Sorensic, all brilliant baseball men, and I've learned much from each of them. A quick special mention here for Peter Vukovic and Bruce Souter, the two baseball men I trust the most with what I know. We have seen much. As a talent evaluator and scout, I patterned myself after Bill Brick, Gordy Lakey, Chris Wynn, George Zura, Bobby Schaefer, and Charlie Kerfell, all no-nonsense types, always willing to put their neck on the line for a player that they liked. It was on this non-playing side of my baseball career that I saw how huge Major League Baseball had become and realized how lucky I have been to have spent my entire working life in the game that I love. For those of you who are concerned that our game has changed, it has. Strike out, walk, homers today is pretty much what you get. But our game can change back, and eventually another George Brett will surface. He'll hit 360. He'll homer 40 times. He'll drive in 160 runs. He'll strike out 75 times. He'll walk 100 times. His own base percentage will be 420. Our game is fluid. Hitters will begin to beat the defensive shifts and the pendulum will swing back. The game evolves. It's just a matter of time. <laughs> Briefly, I would like to talk about advocates. While I've had many advocates in my lifetime, Robin Yount pushed really hard for my Hall of Fame candidacy. Bud Selig convinced myself and others that my candidacy was legitimate and if elected, it would be for the good of the game. When the St. Louis Cardinals selected me first in the June 1967 draft, they brought me into their historic and very successful baseball family. Milwaukee Brewers became my second baseball family. They embraced me and immediately made me one of their own. Next came the Atlanta Braves, followed by the Pittsburgh Pirates, Cleveland Indians, San Diego Padres, and the Seattle Mariners. I have spent lots of time in all of these baseball families and they have affirmed and included me. So I have lived within many families and I'm about to step into baseball's most elite family, and I am incredibly humbled. <laughs> to close, a few short words about my real family, those who have been with me the longest and loved me the most. Tony Guerrero, 
John Lasala and Steve Horn, thank you. John Hamm, thank you for bringing your mother and father along. It was so nice to fi finally meet her and to see your father again. Russell and Rick, thanks to you and your loved ones for coming and bringing Marge, David, and Russ with you. Nina and Ned, thanks also to you and yours for showing Bill, Bonnie Sue, and Bopper all around this real remarkable place. John and Matthew Simmons, Haley, Vanessa, Mina, Dylan, Nari, and Madeline, you are all my very own. And of course, Marianne, my partner, my companion, my equal. She remains the same girl that listened with me not so long ago to the lyrics written by some pretty fabulous folks back in the day. And those words, and in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. Peace and love, sweetheart. We finally got here. <laughs>